Hello and welcome back to First Steps in Learning C-Sharp from Protopic and Realcon Systems. This is Lesson 3 and my name is Roy Fisher. Let's quickly recap what we did last time. We created an integer variable, a constant. We did some simple arithmetic. We are using x++ plus plus and x equals x plus 1 and so on. And we tried to do the same with constants and it just wouldn't play. We looked at this formatting string within the right line method and we looked at these format specifiers. We then modified the um, approach to using these format specified by using string.format and then we finally finished off with the teaser if x e uh, is less than zero console.rightlines. That's where we're going to start today. We're going to look at this the if statement. I've started a new program in C sharp. It's called lesson three and to this lesson, uh, so to this stub, this program stub, I'm going to add two lines which I copied from the previous program. The if statement followed by a console read line. The console read line is there as always to give us a chance to see what's happening on the console window. But I have two red squiggles. One tells us that x doesn't exist and s doesn't exist. We need to declare x and s before we can continue x is an integer with a shroom and I think we can say quite happily that s would be a string. So that should help the assignment problem but hasn't changed. Check the message and it now tells us it's an unassigned local variable. Betcha that does as well. It does as well. And the reason for that is in C sharp we're not allowed to use a variable unless it's been given a value. We'll fix that problem right now. We'll give x a value make it 5, and we'll give s a value, we'll say hello, semicolon. And we could run that program now. The squiggles have gone. Here's the output. Shouldn't be too surprising if we can understand this line here, line 17. If x is greater than 0, that says, greater than, well, x is 5, 5 is greater than 0, so that expression inside the brackets is true. It then writes out the line and prints the value of s. Let's just focus on this line 17. Let's have a look at its general shape. An if statement is made up of three separate parts. The word if, a C-sharp keyword, followed by an expression which can evaluate to either true or false, more on that later, and a payload. So if something is true, do something. We're going to look at these one, two, three parts and I'm going to remove the last one for the moment. I'm going to cut that out. If something is true, that essentially says do nothing. Let's run it, see if it's happy. It's delighted. We're not. There's nothing output on the screen apart from this flashing carrot or cursor. And that, of course, comes from the console read line waiting for an input. An if statement will always have, as a minimum, three parts. An if, followed by some true or false expression or boolean expression inside brackets and a statement. That statement may be an empty statement. I'll put back my line and it says if part one expression part two do something part three. Let's change the comparison operator inside this expression. That's a greater than comparison operator. We'll change that for a less than and you can probably imagine is that this test will become false. That expression, x is less than zero, is false. It's not true. So we would expect just to see goodbye. And that's what we've got. Let's change our program so that only if x is 5 will it write out this hello line. Let's make the obvious guess right now. We'll change the less than comparison operator for the equals. The C-sharp compiler just does not want to play. Our problem is in the use of this equals. We've used equals before as an assignment operator. It doesn't like being used as a comparison operator. We actually need two equal signs to do this. We'll change our 0 to a 5, like so, and run. Hello, goodbye. Let's just think now, I want to extend this program. I want to be able to add another line, so that when it prints out, when it finds a 5, it prints out hello, and then another message. Hello, number 5. Let's run that. Seems to do what we want. Hello, number five. Goodbye. 
but we have a problem. And we'll see that if we change this sign to something else. Let's make it if x is less than 5. Run. Number 5, goodbye. So, it's printing out this line and this line, but we only wanted it to print out this line after it printed hello. Our program is not working to plan. Let's fix. We only want to do one thing after this true or false expression. We're only allowed to do one thing, but we need to do this in two lines. So what we have to do is to use a grouping method to make these two lines equivalent to one statement. That's what we use the braces for. That open brace followed by a close brace. We can write as many lines inside here as we want. One side effect of all that is that these if statements can get horrendously complicated as we'll see later on. And to help us keep track of opening and closing braces, I often find it useful to start a comment on the closing brace and then a copy of the line to which that closing brace refers to. This way, even if we have lots of lines of code that stretch way beyond the actual visible screen that we can see, we can keep track. It's very easy to get mixed up with opening and closing braces, believe you me. Now we said if x is less than 5, we should be able to do two lines at once. Goodbye. Now we're not getting the number 5 coming in. And if I change this to equals 5, then we get precisely what we wanted in the first place. Before we extend our exploration of this if statement, I'm going to introduce a new data type. And it's one I mentioned in the passing earlier, the Boolean data type. I type in bool, and I type in flag. So bool is a keyword. We can see that because it's in blue. All C-sharp keywords are in blue. In case you're wondering about the name bool, then this wiki entry should give you some idea. Let's just copy that hyperlink to wiki for George Bool, a 19th century mathematician. And in here, I'm going to put in a comment, and I'm going to paste in that link. Very handy if you want to point to, say, part of the MS library. If I hold the control key down, it appears there. This, of course, is, works in Visual Studio. I can't guarantee it working in your compiler. Our friendly compiler is telling us that we've declared flag but never used it. Let's use it. Let's cut this out. Cut and paste in or, put, or type in the word flag. We've gone from a green squiggle to a red squiggle, which tells us we haven't assigned a local variable. Over and over again in C sharp, you'll see this happening. Uh, we must give a value to something. We can't just leave it hanging. Let's fix that problem right now. Flag equals, and I've already got a Boolean expression, which I copied, paste it in. exactly the same result as before. Some may find this way of writing the equality, the equals x equals equals 5, a little bit uncomfortable. If it helps, you can put round brackets in the expression, or around the expression. It makes no real difference. It's up to you. Before we go any further, I'll just paste in a little comment which shows us some of the other comparison operators we can use. The double equals, of course. The, there's a new one. The not equals. That may come as a surprise. Exclamation mark. X greater than 5. X greater than or equal to 5. X less than 5. X less than or equal to 5. All of these work in their own way. I now want our program to print something out if this flag is false. In other words, if X is not equal to 5 in our current expression. An obvious way to do this may be the following. It's this if statement repeated again, but this time instead of flag by itself, we have this exclamation mark, which we should read as not flag. Now, not true is false, not false is true. The two just are different sides of the same coin. So that's the not sign. So if not true, in other words, if x is not 5, then it'll write these lines out. 
To test this, I'm going to change that to the number 6 and run. And we get hello. Fine, that's unconditional. It's not 5. That's that line there because the flag was false. And it was false because 5 does not equal 6. And then it says goodbye. In programming, this type of requirement is very, very common. If something is true, do something. Otherwise, do something else. Well, we're going to remove these lines and put in a more useful construct. So I'm going to delete. And I'm going to type in a keyword, else. Else. And after an else, it comes in blue, so it is recognized as a C-sharp keyword. Else. Um, I can do one thing. But that one thing may be comprised of many different statements, so I'm going to use my braces to contain these statements. And the lines I'm going to put in will be as before, and remove some extra carriage returns. If that is true, do this, else, or otherwise, do that. And there's a result. It's not five. Goodbye. Time for another data type, the character data type. And I'm going to put it here. Char, blue, keyword, ch, semicolon. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But one thing I want you to recognize, of course, is this blue nature of C-sharp keywords, apart from obviously the stuff. Bool, char, int, string, string. Well, that's strange. String is in green. Because the string that we're using here with a capital S, remember C-sharp is case-sensitive, is different from the C-sharp keyword for string. I'm going to replace that with a string without a capital. The blueness appears, tells us that indeed this is a keyword. String with a capital S is actually a part of a class called system string. And to all intents and purposes, we can treat the C-sharp keyword lowercase string the same as the class system string. But I'm going to continue to use string with all lowercase characters. Let's focus again on this declaration line for a character, char ch. And I'm going to attempt to give ch a value. And I'll do the obvious thing first. I'll put an equal, assignment equal, followed by quotes, followed by the letter, we'll say, small h. Clearly we have an error here. And the error is that h with double quotes is actually a string and a string and a character are two different types. Truly, a string is a collection of characters, but they are not the same. I can get round this rather strangely by putting square brackets with a zero inside. The error disappears. I want to examine the value of ch here. And to do that, rather than put in a right line every time, I'm going to click to the left-hand side to create a breakpoint. Now when I run my program, I get the console up, console window up, it's blank. The code is stopped running here. And if I hover over this, then I can see any values. At the moment, is ch has the value zero, or single quotes, backslash zero, as it says here. I need to get the code to move on another line. And to do that, I'll use this button here, which will step over that code. So the code then executes on that line, and the execution moves to the next line. Move that mouse again, and ch now has the value of 104, which is equivalent to a small h in single quotes. Notice those single quotes. They're very important. Let's rewrite our code, but somewhat more elegantly. Notice we're still running. We're in break mode at the moment, so I'll stop the program before we can make changes. I'll keep the breakpoint there. I'm going to replace all of this with a much simpler line, single quotes, itch, single quotes. Now I'll remove that breakpoint so you can see any colors, and we just have the color green. Well, we can handle that. Putting breakpoints into your code are just one of the many ways that Visual Studio and similar compilers allow you to debug and run and check your code. Let's go back to the slightly more clunky method we employed before. I'll put in a right line. And here we see console.writeline 
and in quotes, ch is placeholder zero. Of course, I need to have something after here, so I can try comma ch. Give this a spin, and it says the first line ch is h. We'll ignore the rest of the lines. If I'd wanted, I could have said ch dot, and then uh, we can see our two string method. Remember the brackets open and close. Either way, the same result. I've modified the message inside these two right line statements here uh, to say rather than five, it's an itch. It's not an itch. I'm going to change this flag accordingly. Ch equals equals, and then single quotes. Remember, and running this will confirm that ch is itch. That's that line there. Hello, it's an itch. Goodbye. When I'm comparing characters, I can use any of these comparison operators. By itself, the if-else statement is not terribly useful for making decisions based on a number of choices. For example, if I have a program that might look for input for, say, the number 1 for option 1, number 2 for option 2, and x to exit, then the if-else statement could get rather complicated. We'll change our program and write the stub of a program that can start to solve this problem. Here's the program we'll use to do that. It won't run at the moment because of that red line there. We'll fix that. But before we do that, let's just go over the program. Uh, namespace less than three. There's the end of the brace, the opening brace of that. Class program, class program, main, main. And I've put these little comments to show where the end braces come from, just in case that's useful to you. So we start off by asking type in one, two, or x. And then we read a character or we try and read a character, at the moment it's not going to work, from the console. If that character we've read is a 1, print out you, cho you chose option 1, else if it's a 2, do this, you chose option 2, else if it's an X, do right goodbye. Otherwise, if you typed in something other than a 1 to an X, then here's a wee reprimand, but then, irrespective, the program ends. Let's look at our read line problem. Hovering the mouse over the console read line shows me the error. It says it can't implicitly convert a typed string to a character. From an earlier example, we just want the first character, so I'll put the square brackets in zero. There's other things we can do, but that's good enough for the moment. We'll run. Type in one, two, or x. We'll type in a 1 and press enter. You chose option 1. Let's for a minute just consider what would happen if the person typed in a large x instead of a small x. Let's check. Here's our input screen and I'll put in a big x. Shift and x and enter and it says 1, 2 or x only. It clearly hasn't recognized a little x and a big x as being the same. In fact they are entirely different. So it drops into a catch-all statement at the bottom. Now in practice, we're probably not, we don't really want to go in and start testing little x's and big x's. So we can use a, a method of the character class to do this for us. ch equals char dot two and then two upper rather than two string. It's ch in there. So we want to convert ch to uppercase. We could have chosen to lower. We have to change this x to a big x. It would have been simpler if I just said to lower, but for some reason I fancied to to upper. Don't know why. Let's check. Type in 1, 2 or x. I'll type in a little x and it says goodbye, which is fine. Program ends. I'll run again. Type in a big x press enter, and it says goodbye. So whether we type in uppercase or lowercase x, our program works. There's more to making decisions in C-sharp than if and else and else if, uh, but we'll come back to them at another time. Next week, we'll be looking at the power of repetition, repeating statements in C-sharp. Until then, goodbye.